big draw now. <laughs> <laughs> when is this happening? This afternoon. I might melt. She's a hell of an every half of my enemies. I just noticed Morris is like I just noticed Morris is like It's a heavy crowd. The guests have to do a genocide according to my Turkish friends. Oh, okay. Okay, we're going to get right into politics. Uh, hi everyone, welcome to uh, the one-on-one -on -one with Tom King. Uh, I am Jamie Rich, I am editor of Sheriff of Babylon, uh, so I get to wrangle this one here to, to make Sheriff sure come out. Tom, Tom is also the writer of Batman for DC Comics and for another book for our competitors, uh, Division. So, Sometimes it's hard to write for Mitch Garrods. Garrods. He said it was like Airheads with a hard G. I don't know he's not friends. He's one of those it's hard to write for Mitch Garrods just knowing how awesome and handsome he is. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, that, that does um, bring up um, a serious point um, that Mitch is just not at all handsome. <laughs> Um, but he thinks he's really handsome. He covers it with the beard. He thinks the beard doesn't like throws us off that we don't understand it. Like that's yeah. all he wants so asking. He just texts me selfies like once every hour. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, 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 it's actually kind of lovely. Every, every once in a while he actually will accidentally send in like a layout for Sheriff of Babylon where you can see the photo underneath that he took of himself <laughs> to pose in these weird poses and so I'd be quite frightened of what his, uh, his, his photo booth on his laptop looks like. <laughs> Do you guys know that the, the Mitch, Mitch is a, I love his use of photo reference, but he takes pictures of all the things he draws first and uses his, his wife is Sophia. And, she, and, she, and so he buys, he buys all these props, and so like there's a, what's that fancy word for what John Byrne does? Virginia. There's like a, there's a picture. Oh, Fometti? Yeah, there's a Fometti yeah. sheriff out there somewhere, starring Mitch Garrett's and his wife. Yeah, <laughs> and then actually like they literally are, there's a scene in, was it issue two, where they go to the morgue? And his wife and he are the ones running the morgue. They're yeah. Are <laughs> arguing over whether this is, like the dead body they have is the dead body on the video. <laughs> so it pops up. We had a we did a process spread where he revealed that the one of the little kids, the Iraqi little kids, was his nephew, and we had to get like the nephew to sign off on like his likeness rights so that we could actually run the photo. <laughs> his nephew is the star of season two now. Stealing. That's right. right. That's good. Uh, the nephew that loves that demon. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we've been working on Chair for Babylon now, I guess, year and a half. Uh, when I first got to DC, in March of 2015. Uh, so where were you? Where was the project at? I guess when I got there, how did it come about? Uh, it was kind of this the, the quick origin of Sheriff of that one. Okay, I'll tell you a true story instead of what you should say, because that's really kind of an um, <laughs> uh, So, so I had. Uh, um, I'm gonna do some parts fast and some parts slow. Um, I Karen Berger, um, you've taken her. You're the new Karen Berger. So you tell me. Yes. Um, she she was the most powerful person in comics for a long time. So now it's you. So. Excellent. Yeah, that, uh, she pulled me off a slush pile and emailed me and asked me to pitch her a series. And uh, I pitched her a series and she hated it. Uh, it was just died on the table as I said it. And uh, but so as my consolation prize, I didn't for meeting with her just so that I wouldn't talk to her anymore. She handed me off to an editor to be like, write me a pager and go away. Um, and uh, that editor was Mark Doyle, who's currently the editor of Batman. And we did an eight pager that was nice and time work. I don't remember that from a long time ago. And, um, and 
and, and it was good enough that they said I could pitch it again. And so I pitched it in, and I was like, I was like, what do you want me to pitch? Like what? When you're when you're a comic person, you want them to sort of pitch you in a box, which I do, or like, so you kind of know. It's, it's such a weird game you play with editors because right. you you want them to think that you're confident in your idea, but what you're really trying to guess in a pitch is what's in their head, especially if you're unemployed. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like you just because at, at some point, if you're a freelance author, you don't give a fuck what you write. You just want to pay your grocery bill. Um, so you're like, oh, does he want me to write ponies? Because I'm fucking. <laughs> Um, but you don't want to see when you're like, oh, maybe he doesn't want me to think I'm the guy who writes ponies. So you're like, yeah, well, you know, if you're, you know, yeah, pitch whatever you want. Yeah, well, if you have any ideas. So, um, and then I was in the CIA, and I, I and I had done this sci-fi story, so I thought they would be like, no, we need something to replace Scalp, so pitch us a crime series. It's like, oh, that's that's totally what I do all the time. Crime series is my favorite genre. Uh, so besides ponies, I'm number one. <laughs> uh, and then I, it really wasn't like I had never done anything crime series before. And uh, I pitched one crime series, um, and, and it went all the way, got past Shelley, because Karen had left at that point, and got to Dan, and Dan's like, who the fuck is Tom King? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so that I was killed. <laughs> and, and then they came back to me, like, pitch, that didn't make it, pitch something else. And at that point I was like, it had been a year and a half since my novel came out, I couldn't publish another novel, I couldn't write, I was like, I, I, so I, was like, I have to write something that someone's going to buy. And I was like, I'd never written about the, my experience in the CIA and the wars, kind of feeling it was cheap and I didn't want to do it. Um, but I was like, I, I gotta not be a stay at home dad because it's horrible. Um, <laughs> no offense to stay at home. No offense. No, no, no. That's, that's respect to stay at home dads. So we know the true horribleness of it. Um, um, so I very cheaply, I was like, the one thing I can do where there'll be a lot of attention is write about the war. Um, so I was like, okay, crime series set during the war, and that was that's how Sheriff started. And I pitched that, and I was like, this is, man, this is on the CIA, crime series war, good, and, and Shelley approved it, and I got to Dan and said, who the fuck is Tom King? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, that happens at least once a week. <laughs> yeah, no, I, was, I was at dinner with him last night, he's like, and you are? <laughs> it depends on the inflection. Sometimes it's like, who the, like, who the fuck does he think he is? <laughs> yeah, <that's me>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about the timeline out here. So you were in law enforcement before you were in the military. Do I have that correct? No, I was in Vertigo Comics before I was. So you were you were you were the intern at Vertigo. I interned in Vertigo pre-9/11. Okay. 1998, 99. That's all. That. And so then, me and what were you doing when 9/11 happened that caused you to? Is, it, is that when you joined the CIA or? Yes. Yeah, so I uh, I wanted to work in comics my whole life. That's all I've wanted. And uh, and I got I entered in Marvel and used Vertigo uh, and then Marvel and uh, I was at Marvel and I they bought an idea off me they paid me five hundred bucks for it for the pitch wow they paid me five hundred bucks for a pitch I know I did that <laughs> and my page and they can and, um, and I thought I was like dude I'm the next gym shooter I'm thirteen <laughs> <laughs> in there and, um, and and then everybody at the company got fired. And they went bankrupt. <laughs> it was about five hundred dollars. <laughs> that was just interesting. Yeah. They looked at it like, who the fuck is Tom? <laughs> um, and uh, and then everyone was like, comic books are dead. They're going to collapse. Uh, so I um, went to what my brother always wanted me to do, which is try to become a lawyer. And I went to work for the Justice Department in this little. Uh, Part of the justice really helped a victim of cancer who had been exposed to nuclear radiation. And, uh, and I was working there uh, with, when, with my now wife, uh, then girlfriend, was at the desk next to me, and that's where 9 11 happened. I was working across the street from the White House. And um, we did the stupidest thing you can do during 9 11. We went outside and said, Oh, but the White House looks really cool right now. And so we just walked, we stood in front of the website, like, where's the biggest target in America? Let's just stand on it <laughs> <laughs> and, and see what that looks like. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, I mean, those people who crashed in Pennsylvania, they literally saved my life, because that plane could have been gone into me. Um, and, uh, yes, that's where I was in Ireland, at the White House. And so then how long were you in the military? How long were you overseas? I was in the Southern, uh, so I joined, this is 2000, 2001, I, I basically joined. I, I say the day after, but, you know, it's like the months after I applied and that kind of thing. Um, and that's, it took about a year to get, uh, a year to get the security clearances, basically. I'm, this is Maryland, you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, 
And uh, so then I, I joined in fall of 2002. Um, and uh, I worked the Iraq War from back here for a little while, and then I went to the, the farm to do the training thing. Uh, then, then I had two weeks at home, I made, proposed to my wife, and I shipped off um, in 2004. It's a strange path. Like, I'm going to do comic books all my life, and then you end up in the CIA. And, <laughs> I know, it's weird, right? And then you come back to comic books. I used to use comics in the CIA. I used to use them. Because, like, you know, I did a lot of traveling where I couldn't sort of, I wanted to look like I wasn't in the CIA. Right. And nothing looks less like the CIA. Than <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a fucking nerd, so I think it's in the least insulting way, but that's what I would do. I would bring a ton of comic books, and I would just be like, well, that's, that's not James Bond there, that fucking <laughs> <laughs> um, Great, this could be your cover now. This could be your cover now. This could be your cover now. This could be like a massive stain to like, destroy the comics industry from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> there's a Reddit thread that I'm, there's a conspiracy theory that this is like a propaganda thing oh, about wow. the CIA. It's, what a horribly dumb propaganda. Oh <laughs> <laughs> well, no, now you're in charge of Batman and he's going to brainwash all the time. Right. But I'm telling you about it, wouldn't I hide it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's, that's your trick. trick. That's yeah, it's your, your it's death like, of vertigo yeah. in you. Yeah. Yeah. That's the Grant Morrison <laughs> plan <laughs> <laughs> So you ended up doing chair for Babylon. Uh, yes, which I so I pitched, so I pitched it at the same New York Comic Con. I pitched it to both my literary agent and to Vertigo, and they both said yes. And then um, I wrote, so I, I I wrote both. I wrote the first issue of Sheriff, and I wrote, then I took that first issue and turned it into the, the first chapter of the novel, and I kept writing the novel and finished the novel before Sheriff was approved in Vertigo. It takes you so fucking long to prove projects. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I say you said with the, that you got your contract in time before you finished the novel is pretty good for us. Yeah, well, she, I mean, the way Gracie gets a mark, so thank God for Scott Snyder. I say that like six times a day. Um, uh, mark and Scott had worked together on the, the vampire, American, American vampire. vampire. And then, so when they needed a new editor for Batman, he suggested Mark Doyle to go over from Vertigo. And then Mark's like, hey, now that I'm here, Dan, Dan doesn't know, have to know who the fuck you are. He just hired him. <laughs> and he hired me along with Tim Seeley, another Vertigo writer, right. um, to be on Grayson. And then once Grayson became a hit, uh, Hank Knotts, yeah. who was ahead of Vertigo back then, he said, why don't you do any Vertigo projects? And I said, you keep fucking rejecting them. They're in the pile. And they're like, oh, well, now they're approved. He didn't even look at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. Yeah, so that's, that's how Sheriff got the green light. That's always the key is they get stuff approved without them reading it. They don't have to explain yeah, it. Yeah, that's good. Once you have to start explaining it, it all falls apart. Uh, so th that's interesting though too because it's like you got you were handed Grayson and you turned it into a James Bond spy thing as opposed to being Nightwing. Yeah. There was then that, that stood, there still was no who the fuck is Tom King and why is he <laughs> making, taking Robin out of his costume. I think they just put up because they're like, okay, so people kind of know who the fuck Tim Seeley is. Right. And then they're like, and then they're like, the name's Tim Seeley plus CIA guy, so it was just like CIA guy. That was basically a publicity machine for Tim Seeley, which I still have, I think. Tim Seeley thinks a lot of people know who the fuck he is. <laughs> That's right. If he'll tell you otherwise. So, um, yeah. yeah so. I mean, I think one of the challenging things on Sheriff of Babylon, how many, how many folks have been reading Sheriff of Babylon? All right, so good. So everybody <laughs> takes what they're talking about. <laughs> Uh, is that you balance these three points of view. You've got Chris Henry, who is basically uh, our CIA operative. You've got Sophia, who is like the godfather of, of Iraqi crime. And then you've got this completely other side is the ex lawman who worked for Saddam Hussein, Nasir. And they're completely different points of view. How do you balance that many different characters and give them an equal amount of time that they get? And I feel like Chris gets screwed over all the time because he's the least interesting of them. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I really, I, I, I want to repeat myself in some stuff, but I, I really didn't want to make this a, a book about a white guy going to a brown land and having an epiphany. Um, just because you've, you've seen that book too many times. Uh, so I wanted to tell it from different perspectives. Uh, and so I, I, was, I was like, okay, I'll have a Shia, I'll have a Sunni, and I'll have a white guy having an epiphany. <laughs> because what is writing if not contradicting your intentions? Um, and um, so I, I don't know, what are these, I mean, each of them is just me, they're different perspectives. I mean, some of them are based on people I knew, Sophia is sort of a, a combination of two different, or three different people, 
and Nasser's. I mean, Nasser's basically just Clint Eastwood, and I put him in the rack. Um, <laughs> and then Chris is sort of near me, but I try. The nearer he gets to me, the worse he gets as a character. Right. So I try to push him away, and it, it helps that uh, um, Mitch draws him as kind of like this jockey, confident sort of guy who you know wouldn't put up with any deal at all. So then, I'm, then I kind of understand him better when Mitch draws him. And do you find that when you write that, that the closer your character is to you, I think the more boring he is? Um, no, I'm much more of a narcissist than you are, so I find that. <laughs> no, no, actually, yeah, I do have that problem, and particularly uh, you know debating it these days. Because it's like, yeah, I could go. I was thinking about writing another novel, and I have a novel that's been sort of sitting and didn't go anywhere. And I'm just like, I, the, the musings of a sad white dude right now are not what like, the market's after. <laughs> and even I'm not that interested in it anymore. Uh, so for me, it was figuring out how to do tell my story or tell a story about myself and code it in certain ways. And so when I discovered writing genre, like You Have Killed Me or Archer Co. and A Thousand Natural Shocks, it was creating characters that I could funnel what I was thinking or feeling through that were totally, if not me, totally different in, in their life than what I was doing. And I found that it was actually more freeing. Yeah, I could be more honest without, because I wasn't worried about like coding, hiding behind it or creating an avatar that, oh, that's obviously me, but it's not the thing. Yeah, I feel like if, when you write yourself, like, you, you're so used to your thoughts, they become boring. Yeah. Like, you just like, don't want to put those thoughts on paper because you just live with them all the time, so. Um, so you like, split yourself into different halves and kind of put them, maybe like the like filters so it comes out better or something. I don't know. Because in, in prose, I would deconstruct myself. So like I did this book, The Everlasting, which was basically like the closest I got to a bio, but I was completely like tearing apart things I went through and fictionalizing them and figuring out what was wrong with me, essentially. <laughs> uh, that's, all, that's all right, because figuring out what's wrong with you, it's therapy and words. But what always scared me was when guys would come up and they'd say, that's my life. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Please, please change. Please, please read the ending again. I want you to be better. Uh, so that was always fascinating to me. And, and then taking it very personal when people hated my characters for weird reasons. They're like, it's just me. Because uh, that was one thing I was about the point of view. Was like, hey, did you fear there would be certain judgments for how you wrote Sophia or Nasser or any of the other characters from over there? I mean, the first challenge of the whole thing is like, um, this is behind the scenes, and I'm doing with 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 um, doing TV shows now. With like editors and producers are afraid. I think it's the nicest way possible. But like the first reactions I always get from sheriff are like, oh, we, we need some uh, white dude POV so people can relate to this. Like you have to tone down. That's, I'm sorry, that's just, that's, that's what happens in both Hollywood and comics. Um, and. Uh, I mean, I remember my pitch like, de-emphasizing that because it was just to make it more relatable. But this just wasn't a because you, you don't want, also people don't, you don't want to just read a book where it looks like I'm preaching at you. Nobody wants to pick up that like some book about Iraq or just like oh, you just, you, Iraq sucks and Bush sucks and everything sucks. Like that'd be a shitty book. Um, uh, I lost my track of thought. I was just so accustomed. The, the first <laughs> chapter. Oh, I have had at least more than you did. But they had to deal drinking under the table. Apparently. Uh, this is just the real secret of post Comic Cons, folks. And <laughs> for grouchy at our table. Uh, no, uh, no. We were, we were talking about like, your first challenges of, of embracing these different points of view. I don't I, um, I, I, it's, it's hard to say. Like, like when, I, when I created Sophia in my head, I just kind of knew who she was, and I just wrote her. I mean, there's a little bit of my wife in there who I live with every day, and there's a little bit of my daughter in her who I live with every day. And uh, those, they're very easy to write. Not, everything Sophia says seems very necessary. It's the same with writing Batman. Like, everything he says seems necessary. Whereas everything Chris says doesn't seem necessary because he's always kind of hesitant and he doesn't really know what to say. Like, like Sophia just, she always says the most badass thing you can say. Um, although when Sheriff, you have to disguise the badass with some realism because it's supposed to be realistic. But like, there's a point to that, yeah. So I, those, they're really actually very easy to write. Like, that's always the tip. Is I mean, I've done even panels in the past years where it's like, how do you write female characters? It's like, you just treat them like human beings, and not <laughs> these mysterious what? unicorns that are <laughs> they're humans and they make decisions. <laughs> that's all characters do; is they make decisions. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how many. I did that panel in Phoenix, and it was I was the token guy on the panel, 
is like me telling Duran, some girl who sells colors in her comic was also a stunt woman, so she was quite, quite intimidating. <laughs> and then a bunch of dudes in the audience were like, well, what if they like, uh, have to do something like this? <laughs> like, didn't they do that? Like, it's, like, it's not hard. Well, our job is empathy, right? Like, that's the yeah. we're empathy machines. That's the whole point of what we do is to flies. Um, but it, it, it is, is to look into other people's minds and try to figure out what they, what, how they see the world. And so, I mean, the, 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 I mean Sophia has a miscarriage, and I had to write the miscarriage. Thing. Right. Um, and that was probably the toughest scene to write, where I was just like, you know, I, of course, everybody knows people have miscarriages, and so you sort of check, I, I check the people I knew, and sort of try to float ideas just to make sure I wasn't fucking everything up. And, you know, like, um, yeah, like I, I know very little about menstruation. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be on CBR. No, but I had to write about it. I saw it. It's, it's shitty. Yeah, I mean, it's so stupid. It's just you know. Um, but uh, but like that. I. That's part of being a woman. My understanding of this concept. <laughs> um, so the fact that I, I didn't want to avoid writing it. It's part of her. Part of what she was going through. And, um, and yeah, she just wrote it like a human going through a process. That's another one of those scenes where I felt bad for Mitch, who, like, he's going to have to research how to draw or, or dealing with the, the physical aspects of the miscarriage. And, and he handled it very nice and tastefully. Like, yeah, when you always see, like, in movies, they have, they have, it's always like, you know, they're in an accident, and two seconds later they have the miscarriage, and then it's, like, over. And it's, like, not how it works in real life. In real life, if a child dies inside, I'm sorry, this is fucking really white stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> But in real life, when a child dies inside you, it passes like weeks later, and you have to live with it. And you're still pregnant, you just still feel that inside you. And then you have to live, it just doesn't come when you think it's going to come, and that's just how it comes. That's, and I just don't want to put some actual reality to comics. Anyways, that mess of this character, she said. As a matter of me, like, so we're talking about empathy and how you relate to certain characters. How do you approach a, a guy who's lost both his parents to violent crime? <laughs> Had, but have, have there been lessons you learned and share from Babylon that you're now carrying over as a writer in the Batman? Uh, not enough, I don't think. I feel like, um, how, how do you use splash pages? You know, the sheriff, we do a lot of experimenting with, with splash pages and where to put them. Um, so I, I carry that into that. Like, sheriff, like in that miscarriage issue, we did um, two double page splashes in a row. Right. Um, it's with parable, but one was a super close up, and one was a pull, was a big pullback shot, and um, and I, I just I was like I like this effect. So if you look at Batman three, I, I use that for Finch. There's a super close up of Gotham um, holding up a bridge, and it goes through a double page splash of, of a big pullback, and this one has like this. Like, I literally stole my family and used it in Batman. Um, yeah, I, I, Mitch does things with layouts that, 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 that I learn from every time he does it because he uses the nine panel grid, but he uses it in um, in a way where sometimes the panels will be merged with each other and go over. Like when I worked with uh, on Omega Man, he used the nine panel grid and I did layouts. So I, I described what every panel had, and, and it's harder to describe panels. It's harder to describe in a script what Mitch does. I can't describe it when right. it kind of makes because he's, he's doing weird tricks with time where. Sometimes they'll be together and sometimes they'll be on opposite sides. I can't describe that. And so when I see Mitch do it, I, I was like, oh, maybe he's that trick or some other thing. Well, because he'll do the three panels that are technically one shot, where it's like you, me, and then like the cat. Yeah. And then throughout the page, the where the cat moves indicates what's different. Or the cat might be here, then here, then here. Like, yeah, he really breaks a lot of that stuff up. And this is the most boring stuff, right? Panels. <laughs> Sorry. I actually wants to ask it. Um, Twitter, like, does anybody know what that's called? And not even heard music could come up with a name for it. Like, I'm just trying to figure out like, what that is. When you have one image and you turn it into different panels at the same time. But apparently there's no name for that. Like, you should just call it the Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, what, I guess, what, how much more involved, say, is Sheriff of Babylon or the Vision versus Batman? Or are you equally putting as much time, do, do they all suck as much time out? Or is there, Sheriff, Sheriff is the easiest to write because it's based on a novel, so I'm transcribing a novel that I already wrote. Um, so I know exactly where it's going, exactly where it's ending, and the dialogue is already written. Now, breaking up a novel, making a novel turn into a comic book is hard. But, um, but once I sort of got the pattern, I could, I, I could do it pretty well. Um, it was really hard, 
because it was supposed to be eight issues. Right. And it wasn't going to fit, and I didn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> but then they, they, they extended it to 12, um, and then now worse. And uh, Vision, Vision and Sheriff are really easy to write. So those are like, Batman is hard to write. Um, and it's getting easier, but it's, it's, it's hard to describe why. I think because I'm trying to do something different in Batman, and uh, I'm trying to do a book that's not about, not as, uh, well, it was just those two big things. Number one, Batman's a hero. He's a hero of the book. He's going to win in the end. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> And uh, there, there's no heroes in Omega Man, there's no heroes in Vision, um, and there's no heroes in Sheriff. Um, and and, and so, so that's the weird part of it, that like, there were, I, I don't want that, because you can write a Batman book of Batman is an asshole, right? That's easy to write. Or like, he doesn't win, or he's just kind of like, you know, um, like, like Batman, uh, uh, All-Star Batman and Robin, where you kind of like hate Batman, and you're like, oh. Where, and I think Frank was doing that on purpose, right? He's kind of testing how much empathy you could do with such an asshole. Um, but I don't want that. I want Batman to be, I want to be read by six, seven-year-old kids and be like, oh, yeah, Batman's awesome. And also, I, I'm trying to do something with Batman where it's more broad. It's more, it's a big action thing. It's not a guy staring out a window and contemplating the existence of his life. Um, and it's, it's just, it's different muscles. Like, I, I can write sad, navel-gazing comics now. I know how to do that. <laughs> and I want Batman not to do that. So that surprised me because Vision is so complicated and and so complex and mostly it's, people looking at it this stuff. But but you you get a lot of complex emotions and complex family dynamic and at the same time you are redacting the normal aspects of those lives because they're all artificial intelligence and they're strange. And so to me I read it and go like I don't understand how he comes up with this stuff. I don't get how you, you put yourself there. Vision is easier to write because also because I have the, um, Vision has cap, I, I, I hate captions, anyone knows me, I rant against them all the time. Uh, but Vision has captions and has this omniscient narrator, and that makes it easier because I'm like, if I really don't, um, I can have the narrator take off some of the weight, which is so nice to be like, this is what's happened, this is what they're feeling, I can go directly at it, and I don't have to, whereas Batman had no captions, so you have to read everything and sort of get it all from the dialogue. And same with Sheriff, Sheriff has no captions, it's all done. Right. Um, so that's, and, and also captions is a great tool because sometimes as a writer you're like, this is a fantastic scene, but nobody's going to say anything in it. You have nothing for these kids, especially like a fight scene. Like, who talks when they fight? It makes no sense to me. <laughs> um, and, and I write scenes like, I was like, why would Batman be like, ha ha, Joker, I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> um, and if you have captions, but if you do without the, if you do without the cap, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is really processed stuff. Are you guys okay with this process stuff? Yes. Um, if you do without the captions, um, you're, it, it looks neat and it looks really neat in your head if you do no dialogue stuff, but when an actual comic comes out, someone just flips it. Like, the, their, their eye doesn't pause on it. As much as, because you take so much time to describe it, and they take so much time to draw it. But if you don't have words in there to catch your eye, it's almost like a hook. Like, you have to, like, hook so, that they, so you look at the pictures. Most people will just turn the page, and the comic will be like, I think Batman reads too fast. Um, and so that's something you do with the captions. When I have a page in Vision, I'm like, I don't have anything to say because it's going to be a quiet page. I can bring in the captions and put a little poetry in there so that you slow down and you appreciate the beautiful work that Gabriel and Jordan are doing. That, that's interesting because actually, yeah, in Lady Killer, the first script of Lady Killer that came in, Joel wrote, plotted it out, wrote it, and then did the pencils and then sent me that and had me go over it. And so there's a draft of Lady Killer 1 where both in the opening fight scene, there's a bunch of dialogue. It's something like, that's what you do, you put the dialogue in. And then she goes home, and I have everybody talking at once. I'm like, it's chaos, it's chaos. And Joel just went in and went, nope, 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 nope. Uh, and that's funny, I'll keep that. And basically set the rule, like, when, we, when she's killing people, we don't talk. It's all silent. And it, but it's also was that same thing. Like, one of my like, weirdest, proudest contributions is, I think, issue three? where she's ch having to contemplate whether she's going to kill a child and is chasing him through the house and he goes upstairs and he hides under the bed. This whole, there's like four or five pages of nothing, no sound. And as she walks in and she makes the decision she's not going to kill the kid, she puts the knife down. And so I just added a little TP sound effect. And that's all it was, was like so that people would stop. 
see what the action was, because otherwise I was scared they'd just jump right over it. Like, that's the moment of decision. And it's the weird process of stopping people at the times you need to stop them, so, yeah. giving them the information at the times they need the information. And, and so then, yeah, so then my job just got easier because I just never added any dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> So are you sure you can write that series? I don't. That's actually what it came down to. By issue five, I'm just like, you got this. Uh, my main contribution was all the dudes, the, the jerks. Uh, <laughs>